So I'm Matthias. I'm uh, working for Cocentric, a Germany-based consultancy building software and doing coding, as the name suggests. Um, but I'm uh, actually doing data stuff, data engineering, data architecture. But I did coding years before, I guess nine years ago. I was still doing things with the Spring framework, but I guess my Spring knowledge by now is very outdated um, and all this stuff as well. Um, so I would be interested who of you would say he's a software developer, software engineer? I guess most of you feeling like this. Yeah? Yeah, not that much. Who would say he's a data engineer or works with data? Oh, yes, there was one. Okay, not so much. Maybe it's uh, a little bit like, for, for at least for the software engineers, the same as it's for my com uh, company. Because um, when my colleagues are thinking of data, uh, they either think of mathematics, like really complicated stuff, and uh, no, we don't want to get into it, we, we are happy to get past of this during our studies and then never again. Or they're thinking of really ugly graphical user interfaces where you do drag and drop and create your ETL pipelines and uh, it's not debuggable, uh, there's no code at all, um, and that's something people think about. And to be honest, today it's both. Both it isn't anymore. It might have been, but uh, things have changed. But what other people think about data, and I would later say what I mean with data, is um, that I had, this is a quote from a project. I don't want to have to do anything to do with data. It feels like murder over there. And this murder was referring to, okay, they, they don't have any coding standards. They just do what they want. They're working in notebooks. This is nothing to do with software engineering. Get out of the way with it. I don't want to have to do anything with it. And there are other people um, that actually say, hey, those data professionals we need, really need to use data software engineering best practices. Um, this is what stops them from being productive. Um, um, this, is, this is actually what they need to do. And others, and actually the quote is from someone within the same company as the second quote, um, so they say, no, 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 data is not software engineering. Um, and Teams that don't respect the difference between data and software engineering won't have su success in analytics and, of course, AI by now. And in general, the overall yeah, sentiment seems like, okay, data engineering is quite rough, orange access, but it's just because they didn't adapt any software engineering best practices yet. But if they do, everything around data will just become so easy because it becomes like software. As software is easy, you know, that it's not most of the time. So, but why is it even a question? Why, why are we talking about it? And um, so data is becoming an elementary part of every product by now. It's not like we have data because it happens to, we have, we have to store data because otherwise we wouldn't have anything to show in our application. And yes, users type in data and we have to store it somewhere. But it's really using data for, for value generation is really a thing. Um, and in applications by now, you want, as a user, you want to have to analytics, you want to see things, you want to analyze stuff yourself, you want to do reports, um, understand what other users do with the application if you're an application owner. And so software and data isn't, isn't distinguishable anymore. It's not like we have those people building software and then we have this data team in the data warehouse and they, we just throw over the data over there and then Whatever they do, I don't care, I build software. So it's, it's getting closer together. And we actually see clients not building application platforms, but data and application platforms. Really like, okay, we're building one platform that should support running our applications and doing all the data stuff, and this is one thing. So it's not separate anymore. And the easy part is, if we're talking about data, is the data scientist part. So this is maybe the mathematical part. And I was doing a talk, I think this is three or four years ago by now, um, where I said, okay, okay, how much software engineering should a data scientist, so really the, the guys that are doing the ML stuff, the, uh, uh, the, the 
algorithmic stuff, trying to train models, trying to fit the best model, um, and what should they do? And one of the most important things was the, most data scientists can actually code. I mean, you will learn it not only in university if you're doing software engineering or the computer science courses, but also if you're doing bioinformatics, physics, or whatever. You always learn to code. Some of you would argue, okay, writing Python isn't code. I would say, yes, it's code, it's just not software engineering. So they are not used to do software engineering, and that's not what they learned, and it's not expected to them. Um, but back then in 2010, my engineering know-how for data scientist wish list was like, okay, they should know the limit of notebooks. I don't know if you ever have used notebooks, I have seen notebooks. Um, Think of it like a shell, like an interactive REPL, um, but with some UI elements with it. So you can execute code in whatever order you want to do it. Uh, you can rerun salts, and you can do some visualizations and plots and so on. Um, it's really good for experiments, and therefore a data scientists working a lot in this, because you can easily try out new algorithms, new ideas, having plots. Um, but it's not meant for production, because the order of the cells is actually important, and it makes it really, really easy. I mean, you can write bad code in every language and every infrastructure, but in notebooks it's especially easy to do so. Um, if you want to have more like of a RAND view on this, I really recommend the I don't like notebooks talk. Um, but uh, there was, of course, also a reply because uh, there was Jeremy Howard. I like notebooks, so there's always an ongoing war. Um, and Jeremy Howard even says, yeah, you can do use notebooks for production uh, workloads. I would say, no, don't do it. Know the limits. It's really good for ex uh, experiments. Don't use it for production. Then one thing that might for you seem like, yeah, of course, obvious. Uh, but most of the time for, for data scientists, I've seen a lot of people, hey, they say they just develop anything and they will let it run and maybe have a model and say, yeah, okay, it's good to go. We can just stick a schedule in it, run it daily, and then it's production. And if we change something, we just change it in there and then it's directly in production. So having a development and production system is a different thing. Might be a good idea. Some software design basics, um, modularization, separations of concern, um, I also had things like uh, strong uh, cohesion and uh, loose coupling uh, coming with this. So this is more like, okay, how do I, should I structureize my solution, my software, my my uh, my work that I'm building? What could I reuse? What should I not reuse? Um, some basics I would love to see at data science. Code style guidelines, uh, especially naming things. Uh, if you create new notebooks in Jupyter Notebooks, which is a pretty common and often used thing, it's just untitled one, two, three, four, five, and often it goes into production with those titles. Um, variables from A to Z should be enough. No? Why spend more than one character on a variable name? Formatter, linter, just I'm, I'm not care of what format or what linter to use or what code guideline you, you agree on. Um, just use one and keep it keep it uh, throughout your project. And some, some things are, Yakni, we had it in the morning already, you ain't gonna need it, keep it simple, uh, and don't repeat yourself. Not like a dogma, like I have to do, follow this in a strict way, but um, with a sense of proportion um, when doing your software. And last but not least, uh, learning the art of refactoring. And most of the time, or a lot of the time, the argument was, yeah, but I cannot do refactoring in a notebook. And for a time it was true, because notebooks are very limited if it comes to renaming, restructuring things, but um, they are getting there. So notebook solutions are most likely, mostly in, in a lot of things like a light-weighted uh, IDE in a web version. I mean, VS Code is a web IDE in the end as well. So. Uh, you can use a lot of those tools, especially in notebooks by now. And last but not least, Git. Know and use it. You wonder how much people in data don't know Git, how not to use Git. Uh, some people would say I would have extended to Docker and maybe even Kubernetes, and I would say, no, this is definitely not things uh, as a one as a data scientist should do. But Git is actually very useful. So. But this is only the data scientist part, and this is the easy part, because the difference between data science and software engineering is pretty obvious in most of the time. 
So let's take a step back. When I talk about software, what, is, what does software mean? So it, most of the time it focuses on functions and requirements to be met. I have some requirements that, and some functions and functionality that should be implemented, and I implement both stuff. I'm having tests that verify that this functionality is given, um, tests and unit tests up to a user acceptance test. Um, I'm creating stuff. It's mostly about I write stuff and an application and, and solution um, to that, that I create. And it's used for you, it's made for users, often for end users. It might be actually people, just B2C users, might be B2B users, but it's users. And it's often created to sell something. So either I sell my solution, I sell, or it's software made to sell insurance policies, or it's made to sell uh, whatever. So it's, it's often kind of um, the thing that is sold or have selling something. And sometimes it's even experimental. If, it's, if you do product development in a way that is, everybody says product development should be doable, so driven by data, focused on data, and driven on hypothesis, driven product development, it becomes experimental. Data on the other side, and it really includes all the stuff from getting the data, preparing it, storing it, um, putting it into a data lake or whatever, or a data warehouse, up to I will do reporting, business intelligence, and all this stuff to the point of uh, creating models and doing data science or doing AI on it. Uh, it's way more ex iterative. It's way more experimental. It's not like, okay, you have to build, build this in order to make money, but hey, we have to check the data. We have to find out what the data in it to get some inspiration insights and that will help us steering our business or will help us creating better applications. So it's way more exploring um, than the data, uh, than, than software engineering, but in the end it becomes creation as well. Because in the end, if you have explored it, if you create a, or have f found your, the, the things you were looking for in the data, you most of the time built in production system out of it. And there's an example that sounds pretty abstract. An example, you're building an, an, an uh, application that should do recommendations in a shop. I mean, pretty standard. Now, people who bought this also bought this. Um, what you do is you analyze your data, you try to find what is relevant factors uh, that you look in, what, is, what does people like this mean, well, how do I describe them in the data, and at some point you find that, hey, okay, this part of the data is actually useful and I can use it to train a machine learning model to predict, I, if you bought this, you would be interested in this. Um, and then you productionize it. You build and you deploy these models, you get an RP endpoint, a REST endpoint, this gets integrated into a web application, maybe in an online shop, or it is used to um, send newsletters with recommendations or whatever. So and then it's getting productive again. So we, I think there is some point, yeah, okay, at some point data really gets software and we need to use these properties of software. But there's also differences most of the time if you look at organizations where data is actually um, considered. So software is part of a product org, so it's really like software engineering, it's the head of the product org, it's the CPO or CTO, it's really part of the technical part of a company. And data is often part of the internal IT, so the ones that are also um, doing the printers and the network, or the ones that building, uh, running the SAP system and the ERP system for all this stuff in uh, what is used, and they also do the data and the BI stuff. Or the data stuff might even be towards the CFO because the first function that ever wanted to use data was the financial department because they had to do reports about it, so this was the first use of data. So you have the separation product and tech org versus internal IT and finance. So yeah, different stakeholders, different ownership. And in software, the creator is well known who creates this, who is the owner of this. Most of the time in better uh, uh, products, you also know who is the user of the software, for whom will we build those software. And for data, it's 
quite different because data is covering all over in the, uh, all over in an, uh, enterprise. You have those data which is more like the BI data, financial data, marketing, sales data, and you have data from your applications and um, whatever else. And yeah, you get it at some point because you know there's an API and I can get it, but I don't know who's the creator. Who is responsible for the data to be clean, to be reliable? Uh, I don't have an I just have an RP. Maybe I have a name I can talk to. Um, I often also don't know the user. Often in data or in data engineering, you're just the one getting data from one source, working with it, storing it in another source, and then someone uses it, but I don't know who it is. I just store it there. So um, lots of integration challenges because it's way more uh, over the enterprise, um, but it becomes part of the product as well. As I said, most of the time before it was like, okay, you got just put the data in the data warehouse, by now you want to integrate it in the software and the solution you are building. And data and software is basically a byproduct. Um, so you, you are focusing on the app logic, and if you think about data at all, you mostly think about the structure of the data. You don't think about the content of the data, what is, what is within the data. Um, for instance, I've, the, this picture here is uh, from a shelf in, in a Walmart, I guess. Um, and what you can actually do, I mean, you can take the data model of Walmart and you basically can swap out and then put, the data model could be mostly the same, but you can have completely different data and completely other products in it. Inside, instead of the Walmart, you have kind of the Tesco data in it. The data model itself, it's still articles, it's SKUs and um, all this stuff. So you're thinking more about the structure than the data. And if you're thinking about data, what's different is you need a broader domain knowledge most of the time because you really have to model the data to what, what the domain is and what, what, what is the uh, content of the domain. You have to understand the requirements. Sure, you have to do it in software engineering as well. You have to understand processes, businesses, what is important for them, um, especially if it's coming more to BI, it's getting a little bit different. And, um, there's also a little bit difference in data modeling them. Um, so you want to map the business, what are the processes in the business, what is actually used for reporting, what is KPIs, what data is, uh, are people interested in, and the otherwise modeling to support the software function. So if you're thinking about data as a software engineer, you mostly think about, okay, um, okay, I should model this differently and I should put an index on this so I can query faster and maybe, maybe you think about, oh, sh should I denormalize this because it's easier to read because and then avoid some joins and it would, this is more like the things you have when you talk about data modeling. If it's on the data perspective, you think like, okay, um, this has a relationship with this in this case, and, uh, but this is this business process, so you're thinking more from a business process perspective, not too much from a technical or query perspective. So there's some, some difference over here. And it's tight coupling is pretty normal for data. In, I mean, in, in software engineering, we try to use microservices and loose coupling and having interfaces and g working with events to communicate and having the possibility to deploy separately, but to, uh, services separately. Um, in data, it's often, it's, it doesn't say it has to be quite cu coupled, but it's cu still coupling. If someone changes the format or the content of the data, um, changes a column, adds a column or whatever, most of the time other, other consumers will break. Where you say, yeah, let's just put an API interface in between and keep the API, API stable so I don't care what, what is happening within an application. Um, for most of the data processes, it's still a thing. And data is more like a supply chain in this case. So it's not like isolation, but it goes from data is created somewhere, is transformed somewhere, is used somewhere else, is enriched somewhere, and it's not like this is one entity or one group or one team in a company, but it's often distributed over the company and everybody has some, some impact on the data. Somebody deletes it, somebody changes it, um, and it's really tight coupled most of the time. And one pretty f popular thing in data to use is Pipelines, but pipelines, so you're building data pipelines. 
writing data from one place to another place, preparing it. And one would say, yeah, you can use pipelines and test those pipelines, but pipelines at all alone, they have no value. I mean, pipelines, data pipelines itself is the same as like a CI CD pipeline in software engineering. You need it, you better have it, but having just a data and CI CD pipeline alone, nobody will pay you for this. Right? You will need it to do your work, and the same is true for pipelines and data engineering as well. So, the value lies within the data flowing through the pipeline. The value is the data set that gets generated by the pipeline. So, it's on, yeah, we can do test pipelines, but testing the data within, it's a little bit more complicated. So after going through the difference, what is data, what is software, a little bit, oh, I forgot one, the tech debt part. Yeah, if you, if you have tech debt, in, in software engineering, you mostly have like thinking about scalability, development speed. Um, so what does tech debt actually mean and what, what does it affect? And in data, it's often like trust and quality. If I have tech debt in my engineering, data engineering pipelines and in my processes, the data is wrong in the best case, worst case. And having wrong data is like, no, I'm never trusted again because they showed me the, one, the wrong charts once. I, I cannot use it again. So, um, because, or maybe it was because there was some tech debt which failed a process once or twice, and then trust is gone. So, a little bit different of effects. So, after going through this, so what to learn from software engineering? Now, what what is really for the whole data perspective, and yes, you heard of most likely, I'm, I'm mostly focusing on data architecture and data engineering here, what to learn from software engineering. The first thing is know and structure the user and the domain. And I think in software engineering, we are pretty good with this. We have all these product people working with us, helping us creating gate software. We have all the um, methodology there, how we have canvases, we have event storming, and what all these stuff to, to actually sh understand what we are building there. And I think that would be great for data to use as well, because most of the time it's mostly, like, yeah, I just need to put the data from there to there and do time analysis. For whom? I don't care. The data is there. So it would be really helpful to apply those, those technologies. Then the most controversial stuff is testing. Um, I hear a lot of data people actually say, ah, no, we can't test our d data pipeline because um, it's so much dependent on the data, no chance. But to be honest, we can test. We are most of the time just too lazy as data people to test. Um, so what we can actually do, we can do unit tests, we can do integration tests, we can test our logic. I mean, we still writing transformation, transforming data from one format to another format, adding fields, uh, changing, pivoting them, uh, whatever. Um, and we can do unit tests for those. We can do integration tests for the whole pipeline. But what we have to add additionally and compared to software engineering is data tests. So during runtime, not during compile time where you would run unit tests and integration tests, you have to add data tests because an important part of your functionality and what affects your functionality is only known at one time. At the moment, you are reading data from some source. Then you know the, the most important part. So the data testing part should really be added to every pipeline. Um, but there is also some, some uh, challenges. So unit tests cover only logic. So if I say I do some transformation and so on, yeah, we can test it and we should test it. But what we can't test is changing interfaces. So someone adding uh, a column, changing column names, um, which is quite easy to spot because there are structural changes. But maybe there's changes that change the data, not the structure. So for now, the, there's a field that is, was filled with booleans before and now is f filled with strings. Or it's, um, it's not filled anymore, but the value has moved to another field that was already there. So really change it within the data, within the content of the data, while, while the structure remains the same. And this is often not easy testable with 
with um, unit tests. This has to be done during runtime with data test. Also, um, creating test data is cumbersome, and not everybody knows the possibilities of Gen AI by now. And of course, I think this is one of the main things in where I use Gen, uh, Gen AI is for creating test data. It's the best thing and the easiest thing to do. Um, I, I work a lot with data, uh, Databricks, and Databricks has it really well integrated now in their, in their solution where you can just say, hey, give me some test data for this structure, uh, done. Then also mocking is only partially helpful. You would say, hey, I just mock those interfaces. This is what you would likely do as a software engineer. Yeah, no problem, you just, just focus on the logic, mock your interface, but if I mock them, I don't get to know anything about the changes, so I mock them away. Um, so what you end up doing is doing integration tests with real data. So really production data um, and running them on your pre-prod environment. But talking about prod and pre-prod environments, I guess the ultimate truth in software engineering is um, okay, you have your prod environment and on your pre-prod environment or test environment or development environment, you don't have production data because data safety, data protection laws or whatever. Um, and whenever I come to companies and say, hey, for these um, data lake or data stuff, we need code actually from production in the test environment or dev environment, they say, no, not going to happen, just in the prod environment. And this often leads to behaviors like this. So, yeah, we are testing in production and data. And it's more common than you think, and it's, I think it's most of the time the majority. And most of the time it's because the data is only in production. We don't have the data in, in dev or, or pre-prod or whatever. And what you actually need is, um, so if you are software developers, architects, this is like, okay, I've here, in, if you having a production environment for all your data stuff, you get the production data. If you're a pre-prod environment, you get all the pre-prod data from the uh, software side, and in the dev environment, you get all the dev data from the software side. Um, but uh, this doesn't help us as a data engineer or data architect. What we actually need is we need the prod data in all, all environments. We always need, because we are building stuff that in production needs to run on all the data, and we need to have those data to validate our f features, to, to validate our functions and what we have built. And it's quite hard to argue for most of the things. I mean, there are several challenges connected. The one is the privacy data, privacy challenge. Um, but you can tackle this with anonymization, pseudonymization, whatever. But other things is like volume of data. Do we really want to have data stored in three locations copied all the time? There are actually some smart solutions which do like more like linking the data, creating like sim links compared to Linux um, for those stuff. But it's most of the time, most of the time you just get a subset and an anonymized subset that you copy once over there for pre-prod and development. And what we also need to do regards to the regular flow is, okay, maybe I said develop uh, software and data getting more and more together, so you're creating features together. You are creating features for your application, for your software, that actually combines something in software and in the data part. So you will have to start to um, get those data, if there's a feature in the development environment, creating new data, which you use um, in, in your data part, you have to get also the features, uh, the data over from dev and pre-prod. So it's getting way more complicated. Yeah. And to be honest, this is even a simplified version. Um, the overall version would more like be, okay, I have a data engineer who needs all this stuff. The data engineer builds the platform and builds the data foundation for all the experiments and all, for all the analytics that is done. And the data scientist needs the same as well. So we need, because the data scientist needs all the data from prod and then builds some models on them. And the models are really, again, first in the development, then in pre-prod and later in production. So it's getting really complicated there with staging. Um, it's not like I have this solution and do always do it like this, but it's 
sure that now yeah, just the software engineering practices won't work. And I think this is one of the most important differences when talking about uh, what data is different from software. Who of you has heard from data contracts? Uh, one person, but I think most of the people have heard of RP contracts or RP, um, open RP uh, designs, I guess. This is pretty, pretty common. And um, what pe some people thought, ah, it would be great to have those contracts as well when software or the operational systems providing data for any data analytical system. So we just describe those, we can enforce them. Um, and this, this is an architecture that you also like, where you, they, they have a uh, prototype here and production system, which is basically like pre-prod and prod and some, some elaborate uh, process around when to get the data to us. Um, but the main part is this data contract stuff. And this is really like a data product. I mean, some of you might have heard of the concept of data mesh, which was pretty hyped the last, yeah, maybe it's going down now to the hype, but it's the peak I had like one and a half, two years ago. Um, and data contracts is one of the um, things that came out of it. Because you're in, you have data products, you provide data for someone to use as a kind of a product, and the consumer uses this contract to validate, hey, uh, this is not the data I expected. Hey, we agreed on, this is what you will give me. Um, and so the data contract can be enforced. It's a technical thing. There are solutions that you put it in your CI system to check, did you break or deliver the data contract? Um, and, but most of the time, it's about I, one thing about, OK, people actually read with each other. But most of what we see a lot of is, ah, you want the data here, you have a read-only database user. No, leave us alone. We want to do the important stuff, do whatever data you want to do. Um, but and changes, yeah, you, you will see when we change the database, you know, it will break on your side. Uh, and those contracts actually start people to talk with each other. But for me, it's still like, why should I care as a software developer? It, from a data perspective, these contracts might, might make totally sense. But as a software developer, pff, just one more contract I have to adhere to? Why? I, I, I don't have any benefit, just more work with it. I can do the same as before. So. Um, technically, I guess quite interesting concept. Not sure if it would really, uh, if it gets outside of the data domain and really gets into the software domain. Another thing: continuous integration, continuous deployment, continuous testing. Um, pretty common and standard, I would guess, in software engineering. Not that common in uh, data engineering. Um, this is actually for for all the ML stuff. This, the first part, the CI and CD, uh, is the same as, as in normal software engineering. But what, what is different is the delivery of the continuous delivery, so the, the, the delivery of the continuous deployment isn't a working software, but it's a pipeline. But we heard earlier, the pipeline itself has no value at all. So it has to be one, and this one, in this case, it's an model training pipeline, uh, this is a continuous training. You have to continuously run those things. Um, and then if it's a mo there's a model coming out, and then you have to deploy those models. So it's a few more steps than just, OK, run the test, deploy it. But it's run the test, deploy it, run the thing that you created, the pipeline, and deploy the result again. So it's a little bit longer. It's a little bit more complicated uh, for this. Um, monitoring of the thing. I mean, you have, all of you have, of course, have logging systems and like Datadog or whatever the stuff, or build something with Prometheus and Grafana, and you see what what your system does and how the and so on. In data, it's pretty uncommon. This one here is an example for uh, data testing. Um, this is built on DBT, great tool. If you think about I never want to write SQL because SQL is way unstructured and always crazy to write. Have a look in dbt for transformations. And this is a plugin that actually 
gives you a monitoring and, and dashboard about what is your data quality because you implement tests on your data and with this dashboard you can actually drive into it, you can see how long did it take um, to create those data um, and all this data observability is coined the term now, it's a, one of the buzzwords, um, but I guess most of the things are just what you've learned from software, and software observability um, and getting to data. Documentation, yeah, I guess an overall thing, doesn't change too much from software engineering, could be more, like everywhere. Um, one thing I really like is those architecture decision records, RDS, uh, for actually documenting design and architecture decisions you have taken during creating designing systems. Um, and there's one more thing I want to uh, remind you, um, if, especially if you maybe as more like a software engineer called that, hey, all those data people should use those software engineering techniques and best practices because, hey, you see, they work. They work. How many people in your organization are responsible for data infrastructure? And the up to the orange one to the 57% and also, so we have the company size down here, so companies with 1,000 people, and still there is a maximum of 10 people responsible for the data infrastructure in a 1,000 people company. So this is a maximum of 1% of the people. Now compare this maybe to what would an software engineering org look like. How many people would have an, a, a thousand people company really doing on digital stuff and working in, in IT or IT related uh, uh, stuff? How many software engineers would they have? Most likely a lot more. So um, this is the, for data analytics, a little bit the same. Uh, yeah, it gets a little bit higher for doing the data analytics stuff, but there are less people, the organizations for data are well, uh, 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 most of the time, very much smaller than the software engineering and the product org. So there's only so much they can do. I think they, most of the organizations and uh, people are doing great stuff with the resources they have, but saying, hey, you have to do all this full-blown software engineering life cycle, and there's a lot of things I would say you ain't going to need it. Um, I think that would overwhelm most of them, and most likely this won't change. So this is also from our State of Analytics Engineering, same report. Um, no change to negatively is the headcount, so it, it rather stays the same or even gets smaller in the team size. So what to take away now from, from those things? First of all, of course, can they learn? Yes. And as always, it depends on what. Um, they can learn some basics, the focus on quality, really testing, the focus on testing and all this stuff. Automation, I mean, software developers are pretty lazy. We automate all this stuff if we want, if we don't want to do it again. Um, the focus on documentation. But software engineering can learn as well. So first of thing is, Data is something useful. Data isn't, isn't something that used to be created while we create an awesome application. But data is, has value in itself. Um, we can do in software engineering maybe a little bit leaner engineering. Not all of the stuff we are building is actually required. And being data driven. So really focus, use data to build the right products. And also that coming back to the keynote this morning. Um, I think it's very important, you ain't gonna need this also like, you don't need to build it because nobody wants it. I think we're building a lot of features and applications that nobody ever cares because just someone who has a gut feeling about it says, hey, we need this feature. And if you would do a data driven and have actually the data to verify which features you need, I guess uh, we can build less of the unuseful stuff. And the notable differences is responsibility distribution, so it's more distributed over the, uh, uh, over the company. The compile time versus one time, we don't have all the information at compile time. We have a lot of stuff actually run going on at one time, all the data we are reading, and the headcount is different. So, yeah, we can learn tooling and technology, the goal is different, um, and, but you might think about, okay, fine, but I'm a software engineer, this is software engineering 
conference. This is most, mostly about, yeah, then I'm not a data engineer. So what? Nice to hear, but they should learn it. I have learned it, everything. I'm a data engineer. I would say, and this is maybe the motivation, you as a software engineer, don't be afraid of data. It's an interesting field. Your knowledge, your, pros, your mindset, what you have learned, what, how you tackle problems are really, really valid in data as well. And don't be afraid of it. And that's what I tell my colleagues as well. I mean, code-centric, 80% of our people are software developers. I tell them those knowledge is needed. And software engineering has, would have more influence of software engineering would have a great value for data as well. Then, thank you.